uh, where we last stopped with this idea that, as I said, that you, I want you to take away this, this whole experience that I, the point of departure for me is having an, an impairment and seeing the world through that lens. But the bigger question, which has to be understood for all of you as researchers, professors, administrators, is the question of diversity inclusion. And I'm going to come back to that. And, and, I'm, and I'm pre I'll present perspectives which are multi-layered. So wearing of the multiple hats. So how was it for me when I kind of transitioned from being a student with impairment to a lecturer with visual impairment? What happened when I, when I found myself to be a public speaker or an organizer with imp visual impairment? And what transpired, what kind of experiences happened to me or <laughs> which I co-constructed when I found out that I was a researcher with a visual impairment? And I think all these roles which I played over the past seven, eight years of my life have kind of made me understand universal design, inclusion, and the concept of diversity in a much more nuanced, multifaceted way. I would not have understood this if I would have just been a student with impairment. I would have just kind of thought that, ah, the whole system is out there to oppress me, to exclude me. Look at those people who don't want to include me in their groups and their conversations, for instance. I could have been that student. But then once when you become a lecturer, once when you slip into the shoe of a lecturer, you realize what kind of problems are there, what kind of challenges are there. And how do you circumnavigate that? And similar kind of processes happen when I kind of found myself as a public speaker talking to diverse audiences in different settings, not just only for uh, research dissemination, but just to a lay audience. How do you crystallize complex concepts in simplistic form, for instance? And what, happened when you, what, what happens when you become a researcher with impairment? So I start with the critical reflections of being a lecturer with uh, impairment. So as you see on the top, this is what Shetil asked me in the, in the previous part of this uh, presentation series, that well, this question about disability and identity, and what do I say on the top, you know, like I have, when, I, when I took my second master's, which was my first master's in Norway in international social welfare and health policy, in the second year of that master's, I got an opportunity to teach there part time and to be a tutor. So it was kind of like, okay, I'm still a student, but I can teach and very, very interesting. And I thought that I, I, I have an impairment, so I understand what it is to be having intuitively get it like what it is to have an impairment what i realized is that it's not true because there's so much diversity so much complexity students with impairments no two students with impairments are same no two students are the same that is what I have to as lecturers educators we have to understand the the, the final sub bullet of that uh, of that point treating individuals as unique end in itself instead of saying ah this is a person who is from india putting in those category boxes or this is a student who happens to be from from uganda and who is here and does not speak english very well and the reason why i why i talked about this is because i was made a tutor to some of the students who came from global south countries less privileged countries and who and whose understanding of education was not to undertake critical thinking but to reproduce what's there in the text literally and when they took the exam they got a d and an e and an f and they're like what is happening like i have worked so hard i learned everything i, I reproduced everything on the paper but i did not get the good grade 
And these are some good students coming from their respective countries. And the point could be, somebody could say, ah, these students, they don't know, you know, like you could just dismiss them as a, as a lecturer or tutor and say, ah, oh, yeah, of course they don't know how to write or how to be critical in their thought process or when they're writing. But that would be a very superficial assessment. The much deeper assessment would be to understand what cultural context do they come from? Is it okay in that cultural context to be critical? Or is it very, very jeered upon? Professors don't like critical thinking. They want conformity. They want acceptance. They want obedience. And these students started feeling that perhaps they were not ready. They were stupid. They wanted to drop out some of them. They wanted to go back to their own countries. And I'm sitting there listening to them and I'm like, mm, how do I convey to these students who have been quite successful, who have been quite brave and courageous and adventurous and risk takers to come to Norway so far from their respective countries, that it's a different approach and to do it in a manner which does not dent their self-esteem. So again, I'm giving this anecdote so that when you as lecturers, tutors, professors, administrators encounter this, instead of being dismissive or like saying, doing the, uh, doing the most plausible explanation, going to the most plausible explanation, it's better to just have a conversation, go deep into it, uh, into the idea and ask them what, what's, what's transpiring. That was one, one major thing which happened. So, as I mentioned like a few moments ago, that as a student with impairment, I could have demanded a lot, you know, from my professors and, 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 and teachers and administrators that why is this thing not happening in this way? Okay, I could have asked multiple questions. But then the question is, what happened when I became a lecturer? There was a problem like, there is, there is this question of hitting the administrative wall. There is a question of, you know, there are bureaucratic structures. You cannot, you cannot make things so flexible, so, so lucid, so fluid, that, that there's no way of standardizing it. You have to follow some check boxes. You have to fill them up. And when that happened to me, I kind of understood, yes, you've got to be reasonable. You've got to be reasonable. You've got to be pragmatic. You've got to understand. Again, all of this is trial and error. All of this comes from being in situations wherein the core assumptions which I had, premises from where I was driving at, were kind of undermined. I came, as I said in the previous presentation, from the premise of students should have their voice, they have to be critical, they have to kind of be, have ownership and responsibility, be an expert and all of that. And then when you come to the other side, you say, oh yes, if the student is that, and if you want to accommodate the request of the student, how do you do it? How do you let it pass? through the university system. Very crucial. Yeah, and then again, Eleanor mentioned some, some time ago that Gagan, you are talkative, you are social, you want, yeah, you can do this. I like this dialogical way of, uh, of pedagogics. I have a pedagogic style which is pretty dialogical, like a bit Socratic in its nature, you know. I might ask questions, I might uh, uh, provoke people to answer to me, uh, students, and I enjoy that way of learning because that kind of dialectical debate makes you to think critically. But as I said, some students found out that why is Gaga not saying what he has to say? Why is he asking us the question? Isn't he supposed to say, teach us? And for me, it was like, what am I doing? I, I'm supposed to teach them because I'm just one, e one year, like 26, 27, 26. That's how I, old I was. 
And some of them were 52 years old. Health professionals coming from Zambia, one of them. Almost the age of my dad. And how do I say to him that, listen, I'm going to ask you questions. I'm not going to give you answers. And I would like you to reach to the answer. So, again, that, that conflict, like I have a style, particular style of teaching, particular style of engaging with the audience. And perhaps that style might be uh, anathema for some kind of, uh, some groups of uh, students. So, very, very crucial ideas, again, for, for people to just ponder about. Yeah, as you see here <clears throat> in this picture, this one, I am... Uh, like the I, the idea is this that when I am a lecturer with impairment, I intuitively understand that there is impairment, but I did not get it that if there is a student on a wheelchair, for her it is very very important, or for him it's very very important that I don't have the lecture in some inaccessible place. And for me, I had never thought about it. And I'm being honest about this earlier. Because as you remember from my previous uh, presentation, that I came from a business background. So for me to think about these issues of inclusion was a bit difficult. But then I, the moment you meet other people, the moment you interact with the students who have different needs, you understand, ah, oh, she needs that we should meet on the first floor and not in some corner. Does that building have an accessible toilet? Or is there like a small step just before the toilet? Which is so, which is so common in Norway. It's unbelievable. For other disabilities or other impairments, the story is different. Like if you're a vision impaired person, it's a different story. For, for, the, for me, like as a student, I always would like to get the PowerPoints in advance, but sometimes it's difficult to give the PowerPoints in advance, you know, to share things in advance. Yeah. And it's, it's much more intuitive to understand the perverse effect of impairment once when you see the impairment, once when it's visible, it's in your face. But the problem happens here. What about us? Like, what about these people who have learning impairment, who don't want to accept partially that they have an impairment? And how many of these students just stay quiet? And how do you engage with these students? This is so, this is so, so important that, you know, as a, I have not found an answer to this question. It's again trial and error, but the, the most important thing is to be open-minded, to be sensitive, and to be inclusive, and to give and lend, lend an ear to their story. And then to appreciate the fact that these people are coming up to you and making an effort to talk to you. And not just say, just put in a little bit extra effort and you'll get it. That might not be the case with some students. Yeah, so... If you, which slide is this? This is, yeah, the, the tree thing, yes. One size fits all. Again, you know, like as Einstein so poignantly said, you know, like if you, all of us are genius in some way, shape or form. I, I'm paraphrasing it, but like if you're assessing the, the, the capacity of, or judging the capacity of a fish to climb a tree, she or he will fail, or it will fail miserably and will feel it's stupid. So it's, it's just so important that we don't, we understand that we have constraints, resource constraints, time constraints, effort constraints, we have bureaucratic hassle. But in those constraints, what best can we offer as a lecturer or as an educator? Yeah. So now, move, so that was about the the whole idea of uh, being a lecturer with impairment. So what, ha what happened when I found that I was a public speaker or, a, um, uh, or an organizer with an impairment? The first, the first example is um, 
this whole idea that I am the presentation. I said that I would make this joke that, yeah, like I've made the presentation for people who are severely vision dependent. Severely vision dependent, like all of you. And I could give this presentation by just what's there in, in my head speaking. I could do storytelling very naturally, very easily. And this fantastic incident happened to me. Uh, uh, it was a, a conference, a workshop, which was organized by Shetel and Eleanor and Universal Team in 2016, Belgium, Ghent. I was presenting, and of course, I was presenting without a presentation. And this, and I said to the, uh, the, the participants that you can just close your eyes if you want to. You can listen to my voice. You don't have your, you don't need your eyes to be open. And one participant actually did that, an administrator from Ireland. She closed her eyes. She listened to the presentation. She came after half an hour once and the presentation got over, said, this was so nice. I, I could hear you, I could feel, I could understand what you were saying so well. And I don't know why people don't do this. I felt that there was no stress, less stress. I absorbed a lot. I, and that was so heartening. That happened to me. But again, as time progressed, what you realize is that you cannot do that for all groups of individuals. If there is a, a, in a participant, if there's a person who has, who's hard of hearing, who's deaf, what do you do with that group? And if you don't have sign language interpretation, it's very, very crucial to have these, you know, contrast, to, to have these things contrasted. The next incident or the event is from where I was organizing a panel discussion. It's again an anecdote which happened last year. 12th of February, approximately 2019, uh, in Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. I organized a panel discussion titled Rethinking Diversity, Reintroducing Disability. And again, I am novice. As I said, this is all trial and error. I've never done this before. And I thought that I was being pretty inclusive. But then one of the persons, one of the major professors from there, she asked me this question. Kagan, in your panel, where is the person of color? And for me, it was like, because I've never thought on those lines, you know, the racial lines, never. And I thought that to myself, like, perhaps I am the person of color. And she's like, no, 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 but where is the African American representative? Uh, and I was like, sorry, I did not think about this. And I tried to incorporate her request, but it was too late. The die had already been cast. Other questions about like, never had, never had I thought that people would say, don't wear scented products. I've often entered elevators in Norway, perhaps it's not just in Norway, but like there is this overwhelmingly strong scent of a perfume when nobody is there in the elevator. And I had never thought about it. For me, it was like, wow, like this person had a very strong perfume. And out there, people were dropping this as a, as a condition. People were expecting this. That is say this to the audience in advance. This whole concept of what's a safe space. If you get too much verbal, visual input, you can go out and, and paint or just stay quiet. And again, these ideas, two years ago, I would have just on a theoretical level said, yeah, like, what is this? This makes, this makes no sense. But when I was there trying to organize things, trying to engage with people, undertake public speaking engagements and so on, I found out that it's, it was very, very complex. That's why the question of diversity, that's why the question of universal design of, of a learning environment. Because again, the more sensitivity we have, the easier it becomes for us to respond to or to, to relate to these ideas. 
Otherwise, it's always about us. Stop being such a snowflake. The dismissive approach. This was the picture which I was talking about, like from uh, Belgium, Ghent. Um, I think Eleanor and Shetil might remember that day. Yeah, when the, when the disability uh, service provider or officer from Ireland came up to me. This is the picture about th this. This this was very very important on multiple levels. A, I was representing the opportunities for postdoc equity and networking without being a postdoc. I was organizing it on their behalf. They had never thought about diver including disability within the diversity talk. Because whenever you thought about diversity, the idea was it has to be the racial diversity or the gender diversity or the sexual orientation or the transgender people and so on. But what about disability? So, that, so when I was organizing this event, as you see, if you can, there are people who are, you could say, you could say they are it's monolithic in the sense that all of them are white, excluding me. But my question was that what's the purpose? Why am I organizing this event? And then I had to come to a realization that we have to understand reality through different lenses. We cannot have, a, if I tell Shetil's story, then I kind of disempower Shetil. Shetil has to tell his story, his struggles, his trials, his joys, his successes. The becoming a researcher with impairment, what, what, what transpired, these things are overlapping, but just to give Things, uh, put things into perspective. The first, the first thing which was expected of me was to share my material and PowerPoint and all these, all this information in advance. And although I expected that as a student, when I wanted my teachers and professors to send it to me, but when I became a researcher and I was going to give a seminar or a presentation, or when when Eleanor asked me, Garan, can you share your PowerPoint? And I shared the PowerPoint to her seven minutes before coming here because i was there till the end you know trying to modify it make it better but I, you have to understand that for for this happened to me in uh, trondheim this person said can you do this one day in advance so that i could send it to my interpreters a deaf and hard of hearing researcher because how will I understand the concept of bounded agency or structured individualization or capability input or conversion handicap when you would be speaking? And often I am accused of speaking too fast. This time I'm speaking very, very slow, making a very deliberate effort. And she said, Gagan, slow down a lot because my interpreters have to talk to me when you are saying things. And this was very hard for me, very, very difficult for me, this whole experience. And then again, this question about the, the structural challenges of finding an accessible room, finding an accessible uh, uh, building with an accessible toilet, finding this, the resources for having an interpreter. What if the person does not speak Norwegian language and wants to participate? Could you afford a, uh, an interpreter in English? What, all those questions come up. This was a podcast which I, which I participated in. And that's why I asked and requested Eleanor to, to have this, you know, in this format wherein things are getting recorded. Because once when this presentation is over, there would be people who would want to listen to it, who want to reflect upon it, who are not present out here. Like one of my colleagues or my friends who, who listened, who, when I went to the podcast with Deborah Rue in the United States, and when I was disseminating my research and my experiences this person from germany comes to me and says where is the transcript gagan and i'm like oh my where is the transcript that question i had never thought about it what do you mean by where is the transcript went back to deborah deborah said yeah it's in throat it's in the process of production gagan it'll be done fantastic i six 
four months or six months later in Norway, I, uh, I'm invited at my university, give a, pro, give a podcast, uh, participate in a podcast, Ask and Don't Assume. Very interesting podcast. I ask, so what do we do about the transcript? Because this is not accessible. Uh, we don't have the resources, Kagan. This is a small shop. I'm like, okay. Just to put things into the perspective that how it's not it's not always easy where that you have the right intentions, the right effort, the right right kind of approach. Often you are impeded by the environment. Yeah, so the, the, the most important thing for me from my perspective and the universal design team perspective should be like this idea of walking the talk, you know. You just stop talking about it all the time and see if you can kind of come up with a way to operationalize it, the universal design. See if you could take some steps, like as I say, like the MEP principle, mapping the needs of your audience, the expectations of your audience, understanding intersectionality in the broadest possible sense. Because if you have understood this in a broad sense, then it will not be difficult for you to address small, minor changes. If, let me, let me back back up a bit and explain it a bit more. If you have understood that it that students coming from global south come from a different cultural background, then you would be able to come up with a way to assess them, teach them, and and deal with them in a much more inclusive way. And it's very, very important that, that this mapping happens. And this is very crucial that be it you, are, you being a researcher, lecturer, tutor, you understand your audience pretty well. The other part is the effort equation, which I, which I just mentioned some moments ago in passing, that you have to be very proactive, you have to be proactively prepared, you have to have a sense of greater flexibility, you have to deal with the uncertainty a bit better, and if you can do that, then the that the outcome could potentially be that you have better engagement with your audience. But that does not mean that you will be successful. As I say, like the, the only thing which is guaranteed is learning, that you will learn something. Like what I learned when I was in, uh, at UC Berkeley about fragrance allergies or about safe spaces or about where is the person of color, which never happened to me or never occurred to me. So again, learning is the thing which is guaranteed, nothing else. And then the pragmatic principle that you've got to be, you've got to balance out things. You've got to understand that there's a trade-off. There are expectations and needs of participants, but, but there are also resource constraints and what can I offer? And sometimes it's very important that the lecturers, tutors, professors, administrators, just be open to a conversation, just be sensitive enough for a, for a talk and not just close themselves and say, no, this is way beyond my reach. Sometimes you only need to, to listen to the other perspective and help them, enable them. Taking a few steps, it's very crucial. Uh, and uh, yeah, so as I said, there's a thinker and a doer. I'm just making it very simplistic, but the idea is, is this, that often people come to workshops and seminars and camp and understand universal design for learning and creating an inclusive environment and we understand the diversity and intersectionality and there's, ah, oh, there's a problem which we've got to fix, we've got to do this, that, and there's a lot of thinking which happens, a lot of good discussions. But then, there's not too much of doing, not too much of following it up. And what is most important is, as I said, like roping in, the, roping in other people, be more solution oriented, be inc more inclusive, and so on. Thank you. Now we can have more discussions.